In the previous installment of this series, I built this junk tower lurking in a forest four decades after the arrival of the Blight, a mysterious fungus that infected this world. Today, we're traveling another 50 years into the future, where droids and machinery have become sophisticated and commonplace. In this video, you'll see this diorama come together and learn a bit more about this world I'm developing. And be sure to stick around to the end to find out the very special package this droid has been tasked with delivering. This is Gamey Builds, and welcome to Beyond the Blight. The droid I'm building today is a kit bash, based on a model sold to me by the stalker who is analyzing my search history and predicting my interests. Mm. I don't normally do kits because I prefer building from scratch, but the chunky utilitarian design of this exosuit spoke to me. After removing the human figures, which I'll be saving for a future build, I decided that painting the remaining pieces first would be a sensible plan of attack. After a bit of sanding to help the paint stick, I dusted off my arch nemesis, then painted, using black for the internal components. Then it was on to yellow for the hull and armor. This only took about 700 layers of paint to look good, but as annoying as this process was, this actually lent itself to a happy accident we'll get to in a bit. I also used this opportunity to do a little dry brushing with this dark silver paint for a worn metallic sheen. And also because I don't really build model kits, I've had no need until now of a decent pair of nippers, but by golly I made do with these brute force cutters and then sanded those unsightly edges with these DIY sanding sticks. With the pieces done, I began dry fitting everything together, beginning with the frame. And while I hate to throw anyone under the bus, the quality of this model left quite a bit to be desired, as a lot of pieces just kind of fit, and quite a few of the joints actually broke off completely, necessitating multiple off-camera emergency repairs. Still, I got there eventually, which allowed me to get an idea of how everything fit together and where I'd have to modify. And of course, modifying here was going to be crucial. As cool as the vanilla version of the mech looked, especially after some brown and black washes, it'd be pretty tacky just slapping this into a diorama and saying, here's this unique world I'm making. I mean, that'd be like opening a fast food franchise called, I don't know, Wick Wanolds with a signature Wig Whack Burger and a colorful mascot named Nano Wick Wano. Oh, and come enjoy our ball pit, just watch out for the corner where the kid mimied. So, to turn this Big Mac into a Whopper, I decided to elongate all of the joints. The spinal column was extended first, using this Q-tip to add length. Next came the arms, and while they were too loose at first, a tiny strip of electrical tape did the trick for a snug fit. The other end was then plugged into this plastic bead until it all fit just right. To add a bit of visual interest and give this droid a more commercial look, I decided to mask off the shoulder and arm parts for a clean red stripe. Okay, sorta of clean. And remember how I mentioned that happy little accident with the yellow paint? Well, it turned out, after some experimentation, that I could get some pretty realistic chipping and weathering results by sanding the edges. This only worked, of course, because the base color of the plastic here is dark gray, but it's something I'll be keeping in mind for future kit builds. One kind of weird thing with this build was the mixed stages of fitting, building, and painting. With scratch modeling, I usually save the painting for last, but this time I found myself constantly bouncing back and forth between stages as the droid came together. The legs posed a unique challenge too. Since I couldn't just jam a Q-tip in here to add length, I was forced to get a little more creative. Fortunately, the answer came in a package I'd recently gotten from eBay which contained some assorted Gundam parts, including these guns. After sawing off the desirable bits and adding holes, I made some mini shin kebabs, snipped, added some bead hardware, sprayed it all black, then attached. For some more detail, I wound this electrical wire, then used the newest material in my arsenal, heat shrink tubing, for a snug textured fit and bent the resulting cable-like accessories into place. This particular supply was purchased thanks to my generous patrons here. If you'd like to join this totally amazing group of individuals supporting my builds and get weekly updates on my projects long before they go live here on YouTube, check out my Patreon link in the description below. Thank you. 
Now, since this droid is meant for commercial use, it needed an official logo, which I'm painting here with a toothpick. In spite of the blight, corporations still exist in this world, with several global entities doing the vast majority of business. Most of these megacorporations exist either solely above ground or solely below it, though some span both worlds. The courier droid seen in this build has the designation KP-1301, and as you can probably judge by his exterior, he's seen a lot of action in his travels and is due for servicing. To make the droid's design visually consistent with Mabbit, a droid from this universe I previously built on this channel, I added some antenna fins to the head that previously belonged to a Gundam model. I used the same method of painting and then sanding the edges to achieve a uniform look before attaching. And to make the eye look a little bit more like a glass lens, I drilled a hole with my pin vise, added a fine bead of UV resin, then cured with a UV light. This next detail was a bit pointless, but in a valiant effort to modify each limb beyond the point of recognition, I decided to swap out these robo hands for two fists harvested from none other than Chirrut Imwe of Rogue One fame. After all, what's a Star Wars character without a few random amputations? I finished up with some more bead-based accessories before modifying the hatch on the droid's delivery box, then creating a lid for the gaping hole with this piece of styrene plastic. I then detailed, painted, and weathered. To protect the packages, I also added some internal padding to the container, courtesy of this corrugated paper. And no, I'm not going to show you what goes inside here just yet, because of this thing called viewer retention. It was now onto the base, which I'm again using a decorative frame for. After gluing on some blocks of dollar store foam, I carved it all down with my miter saw, then continued shaping it. I coated the ground in Mod Podge for strength, and these things will eventually be jagged rock formations jutting into an icy sea, but right now they're just foam core. I also threw in some kitty litter for a rocky surface, this probably goes without saying, but if you go the kitty litter route, make sure it's the non-clumping kind. Also, don't use too much of it and then leave it unattended, because you might come back to a stinky feline surprise. Because I wanted KP-1301 to be delivering his package to a mysterious underground bunker, I needed to make one. I used this dense half-inch foam for concrete. This worked out especially well, since peeling away the paper backing revealed this pretty convincing weathered concrete texture. I also scribed the foam with a dull pencil tip to give the concrete seams. Now, I wanted to get a light fixture in here, and hopefully warm up this abysmally cold and depressing building, but the lights I ordered from eBay hadn't yet arrived, and so I... I... I did the unthinkable. I cannibalized my steampunk planter. In my defense, the thing has kind of been falling apart due to the moisture of constant watering and, well, general neglect, I guess, but I still didn't feel very good about it. Rest in peace, steampunk pot. Your memory lives on in this cold, depressing diorama. For the door, I decided to use chipboard, which I found works really well for weathered, bumpy metal. After adding a window, a little panel for interest, and some window details, I finished with everyone's favorite. Paper rivets. I'm super dumb. I then coated my door in Mod Podge and painted with the same technique you've seen before. A base color of dark brown acrylic paint applied with a sponge for a slightly lumpy metal texture, then surface layers of paint, in this case, orange. Finally, for some dimension, a rich yellow for a somewhat sun-bleached effect. To make a reinforced glass window, I used this sheet of clear acrylic, then painted and superglued on this section from a cheap grease screen. I then sprayed the opposite side of the acrylic with a frosted glass aerosol product, making it more opaque. This will make it look cold, but more importantly, it will sufficiently hide the naked innards of my structure. After painting all the concrete bits black, I brushed on this cool blue, then dry brushed on some lighter highlights then added a final black wash. Returning to the base, I coated it all in black, 
since this would be the rocky area's base color. I dry brushed on some grays for definition, and once it was ready to go, I attached a dam with this acrylic so that this resin wouldn't have an opportunity to ruin my life for a second time. One new trick here I used worth mentioning is, to waterproof the dam, I laid down a fine line of UV resin along the seams, then cured. This was my third attempt at resin, and it definitely has gotten better with each try. If you're working up the courage to do your own first resin pour, I strongly suggest starting off small and doing a few tests first to get familiar with the stuff. Oh, and also watch my failed underwater Mario build for what not to do. Although I was pretty happy overall with my attempt here, I will say that I regret going so heavy on the blue pigment, which is a bit more opaque than I intended. By the way, when you do resin, be sure to keep some kind of blowtorch or lighter on hand as you babysit the drying resin, because there will be bubbles and they will need popping. For these cracked sheets of ice, I used the same acrylic from the resin dam and bunker window, sprayed with that frosted glass effect, and broken up. I knew instantly that I should have used thicker acrylic for this, as it looked way too thin, as if the ice were melting, but we'll come back in a minute and make it work another way. Also, to make the water appear cold and slushy, I added some white coloring to my remaining resin, drizzled it in, and swirled it with this toothpick. This technique I specifically stole from Eric's hobby workshop, where he does it in this insane Viking diorama that frankly makes my work here look like a preschool finger painting. Oh, and don't mind these weird little white stilts I had to set my bunker atop. It ended up looking far too big for the scale of the droid, and this was my best idea to resolve that. And once the resin had cured about a day later, I sanded everything down, getting rid of the frayed edges, but also adding a bit more opacity to the ice sheets. I then painstakingly added a second layer of ice for thickness, then more sanding, as the superglue unpredictably made the plastic more transparent this time, then, finally, some Woodland Scenics water effects to give some movement to the water. Finally, the snow. I've made mine with white sand from the dollar store, cheap white craft paint, and Mod Podge. I actually made quite a few different versions of snow, but for the icy base layer, this is what I went with. Working with this stuff was... interesting? It kind of felt like spreading concrete, and I mean, essentially, that's exactly what I was making here. I did eventually have the common sense to make another dam to keep the snow in place, and we'll pretend that happened early in the process. Once it had hardened a day or so later, I mixed up my second batch of snow, this time halving the white sand and adding an equal part of baking soda for a fluffier, fresher snow look. I tried a variety of things as a trowel, but the tool that worked best was the one I was born with, my finger. By the way, this is a third mixture I made for snow, which had a lot more water in it to let the snow flow more naturally. With that topmost layer of snow still wet, I sifted on some baking soda for a final, freshly fallen dusting of winter dandruff. To give the ice the same effect, I dabbed on some glue and sifted once again. For the final ice effects on the bunker, I brushed on this UV resin, then, using that same resin, I painted some icicles, cured, and glued them into place. The robot's legs, which have just emerged from this icy creek, got the same treatment, with glossy Mod Podge giving a wet, chilly look. After adding my signature Beyond the Blight weathered wood base, the droid was attached, and that was that. As always, thanks so much for watching my builds. 
and I can't wait to hear what stories you all come up with in the comments for why this droid has been tasked with such a unique delivery. A special shout out again to the patrons who've climbed aboard since the last video, who are helping me behind the scenes to flesh out this world by naming its regions and offering other awesome feedback. Until next time, this is Gamey Builds, over and out.